and it's at Midnighter. Midnighter alongside his future husband Apollo was part of the top secret Stormwatch team created by the first weatherman, Henry Bendix. Nobody but Bendix himself knew of the team's existence. Bendix built them as superhumans and when they donned their costumes and spoke their code names, their previous identities ceased to exist. Midnighter has the power to predict how a situation will happen before it starts. This allows him to run through a given situation millions of times in his mind, instantly covering every possible result before his first move is even made. He uses this information to predict the actions and or reactions of others, counteracting their moves almost before they even think to make them. Effectively making Midnighter the greatest tactician in the history of mankind. Basically the good guy version of the thinker. That's that's pretty cool. He could he could be Batman just because he knew every single way it would happen. And at 9, the Atomic Knight. The Atomic Knights appeared in every third issue of Strange Adventures in the early 1960s, beginning with number 117 and running through number 160. In all, there were 15 early 1960s Atomic Knight stories created by writer John Broom and artist Murphy Anderson. They were a band of heroes living in and protecting the post-apocalyptic future of 1992. <laughs> yep, at that point it was the future. Following the catastrophic Hydrogen War of 1986. A petty tyrant named the Black Baron ruled a small section of the Midwestern United States with an iron fist. He was opposed by Sergeant Gardner Grail of the Atomic Knights, who wore medieval suits of armor that were impervious to the Baron's energy weapons, the armor having been irradiated in the war. Gardner Grail also has precognition, and wears a suit of armor that grants him enhanced speed, strength, endurance, and lets him blast energy, as well as being adaptable to other technology. And it ate Akrita. Andrea's father was Bernardo Rojas, once a renowned leader in Central America who researched pre-Hispanic cultures at a university in Mexico. She lived along with her cat named Zapata, named after one of the revolutionary leaders in Mexico. Akrata specialized in striking against organized crime. Every time she caught a perpetrator or helped advert a tragedy, she cited a literary quotation or, if she had the time, painted graffiti insulting or challenging the local authorities, which might hint at her being a bit of an anarchist, which honestly I'm kinda into. This character seemed to be kind of a Mexican Mexican Batman, and despite her anarchist tendencies, she often worked with another two Mexican superheroes, Iman and El Muerto. Together with these two allies and Superman, she once saved Mexico and the world from the total destruction from a bio um, bad guy group trying to channel the powers inherent to the ley lines of Earth to accomplish their goals. So, good on ya, Andrea. Good on you. And it's seven Jack O' Lantern. The first Jack O' Lantern is Daniel Cormack of Ireland, who was born to a poor farmer who was granted a magical lantern by an Irish fairy. Yep, that's how we're going with this. Cormack is a member of the Global Guardians, an international group of superheroes. His first recorded mission in Super Friends number eight was to help Green Lantern dismantle a bomb in Ireland. Both Daniel Cormack and Marvin Noronza, the second Jack O' Lantern, have a mystical lantern that gives them the power of flight, flame projection, teleportation, illusion casting, enhanced strength, and the ability to just create. Fogs. The power of the lantern is also its weakest at noon and gradually increases until its peak at midnight. Liam McHugh, the third jack o' lantern, found a way to internalize the powers of the mystical lantern and no longer needs to carry it. So. Yeah. And it's 6 Apollo. Essentially the Wildstorm universe's answer to Superman, Apollo is now technically a part of the DC superhero universe, like Wildstorm ever since the two universes converged following the events of Flashpoint. Apollo possesses many of the same powers as Superman, but with a few notable differences. Like Kal-El, Apollo possesses superhuman strength, flight, and near invulnerability. If you want some clarification as to just how impervious the damage he is, he's able to walk on the surface of the sun. Apollo also has the ability to shoot lasers from his eyes, derived from solar energy. But unlike Superman, he can also release this energy from other parts of his body, including his hands and mouth. This dude can fire lasers from his mouth. He uses hyper beam in real life. His only real weakness is that he relies on the sun for his powers, so if he doesn't get enough exposure, his powers will diminish, but hey, at least Apollo isn't vulnerable to kryptonite. Halfway through in a number five swamp thing. In a secret facility located in the Louisiana swamplands, scientist Alec Holland and his wife Linda invented a bio-restorative formula that would solve any nation's food shortage problem. Ferret and Bruno, thugs working for Nathan Ellery, barged into Alec's lab, knocked him out, and planted a bomb in the facility. Alec woke up just as the bomb exploded, and in the flames, he ran into the swamp. His body had been drenched in the bio-restorative formula, and this affected the plant life of the swamp, imbuing it with Alex's consciousness and memories. The newly conscious plant life then formed a semblance of a human form and rose up from the bog as the swamp thing. The latest in a long line of Earth elementals created when the green was in need of protection. His body is composed of sentient 
in vegetable matter. He has the ability to nourish himself, superhuman strength, elemental control, chlorokinesis, astral projection, biofission, immortality, regeneration, size alteration, resurrection, you name it, and Swampy can do it. Swampy away! And inform Mr. Miracle. Mr. Miracle was Scott Free, the god of escape in the New Gods mythology. A Genesian raised on Apocalypse, he defected with his lover Big Barda to Earth, where he used the skills he learned in Escapology, both as a performance artist and in the Justice League of America. Originally, the boy Scott Free was the son of High Father Isaiah, the ruler of New Genesis. However, as a part of a diplomatic move to stop a destructive war against the planet Apocalypse, High Father agreed to an exchange of children with his enemy Darkseid. In doing so, he surrendered Scott Free to the care of his enemy while he received his enemy's son, Orion. This guy has new god physiology, okay, making him immortal, super strength, super durable, and giving him super agility. Plus, when utilizing his full godly potential, Mr. Miracle wields a cosmic energy field called Alpha Effect, which allows him to transverse through time and space, heal living beings, fully restore creatures back from death, and control energy to an almost boundless degree. Yep. You're on the list. Getting close to the end, in at number three, Jem, son of Saturn. After both his mother and teacher were killed by the White Martians, Jem stole a ship and escaped to Earth in search of his lover Syrah, who had fled there earlier. He arrives in Harlem, New York, and is befriended by an orphan named Luther Mankin. After a series of adventures with and without Luther, Jem eventually found Syrah. They all then traveled to New Bach, a red Saturnian colony. But because he refused to take sides in his civil war on New Bach, Jem was disavowed and cast out by both factions. Dispirited, Jem and Luther return to Earth, and given that Jem is a form of Martian in a sense, his Saturnian physiology gives him flight, metamorphosis, physiokinesis, telekinesis, telepathy, energy projection, superhuman durability, superhuman stamina, and superhuman strength that allows him to match Martian Manhunter blow for blow. So I think this is a pretty worthy number three. And ultimately, in at number two, Karate Kid. Karate Kid is actually Val Armor, a superhero from the future and also a member of the Legion of Superheroes. He is a master of every form of martial arts to have ever been developed by the 30th century. The extent of his skill was so great that he could severely damage various types of hard material with a single blow, and was briefly able to hold his own against Superboy through the use of what he called Super Karate. So he already seems pretty legit. Val Armor was the son of Japanese greatest crime lord Kiaru Nozumi, also known as the Black Dragon. When he was born, his mother, an American secret agent known as Valentina Armor, tried to hide him from his father, but she failed to do so and was killed for her affront. Japan's biggest hero, Sensei Toshiaki, and the White Crane, eventually killed the Black Dragon for his crimes and then adopted the infant Val. He raised Val as if he were his own son, and trained him in all manner of martial arts. Val became the youngest warrior ever to earn the title of Samurai, and he went on to work for his local Shogun. However, after trying his best and failing to please his supervisor, he quit and searched the galaxy for new forms of battle to master. That just goes to show you, people, appreciate your employees, otherwise they're gonna quit and go search the galaxy for new forms of martial arts, okay? And finally, in at number one, Blue Beetle. Jamie Reyes was a relatively normal high school student from El Paso, Texas. His father ran a garage, and his mother was a paramedic, and he had a little sister who was a total brat. Jamie hung out with his two best friends, Brenda and Paco, and he acted as like the mediator between the hardworking Brenda and the laid back Paco. By both Brenda and Paco's accounts, he was a good friend, kind of person who could just let them be themselves and would always make things better. Jamie aimed to help his father out in the garage, but Alberto turned him down, not wanting to see his son grow up too fast. Ted Cord, the second Blue Beetle, had come into possession of the Blue Beetle Scarab, the artifact which had given Dan Garrett the first Blue Beetle his powers. The Scarab had been presumed destroyed early in Ted's superhero career, but it was discovered intact in a pyramid in the Middle East. This is where Jamie gets his powers as well. What are those powers, you ask? The Scarab can and will use its powers of its own accord. Jamie, however, can override the Scarab if need be. And should Jeremy fall prey to mind-altering power, the Scarab will take control of the armor. So it will act on its own, and basically he's not mind control anymore because it's just the Scarab doing it, not actually him. So yeah, number one, hands down. Number 10, Mantis. A new addition to the Guardians team, Mantis went from being Ego's roommate in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 to becoming an Avenger, even holding Thanos down while the rest of the team tried to take the gauntlet off. Now in the comics, Mantis had to endure quite a bit before becoming an Avenger. She made her first appearance in Avengers issue 112, The Lion God Lives. Mantis was trained as a child by alien priests, section of the Kree, who thought that she was destined to be the celestial Madonna. She was killing it in martial arts, hence the nickname Mantis. Now her real name is Brant, but Mantis sounds much 
much more fun. No offense to all the brands out there. Those priests enhanced her mind, giving her telepathic abilities, and on her 18th birthday, she was given the gift of a lifetime. When her mind was wiped and she was instead given false memories of her childhood as an orphan in Vietnam to experience a normal life because that's part of the celestial Madonna route. Nothing builds that Madonna power more than some time in Vietnam, right? And in doing so, Mantis learned to hold it down on her own quite easily. Number nine, Dr. Druid. Anthony Ludgate entered Marvel Comics in Weird Wonder Tales issue 19. He's a bit of a smarty pants, some would say. I mean, he got a degree in psychology from Harvard and then became a psychiatrist. But that wasn't enough for Anthony. He wanted to study the ancient powers of his ancestral druids. So he was studying the occult on his off time. He finally met the ancient one who passed down a lot of tricks and Anthony left and became Dr. Druid, assisting monster hunters, including Makari when they went against deviants. So this guy goes back quite far. He's also a little more dramatic than strange, some would say. In Avengers issue 294, he manipulated Captain America's mind so that he would be the replacement chairman. And this was right after Captain Marvel was injured. What a snake. And before we continue on with this list of strongest Avengers, you wouldn't expect part two. If you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be so helpful for our channel. It really helps us out a lot, especially while we're working from home. And if you haven't as well, hit that subscribe button maybe if you feel like it. I don't know, if you feel like it. Let's get back into this list. Number eight, Firestar. Angelica Jones made her comic book debut in Uncanny X-Men 193. She was born with, well, as you would guess by her name, the ability to generate great heat. Cerebro found her, but the Hellfire Club got to her moments before. She was learning a lot under the White Queen's guidance, honestly, unaware of the cruel nature of the club, of course. See, Frost actually gave her the nickname Firestar. So then Firestar joined as a reserve member in Avengers Volume 3, Issue 4. Yeah, so Hawkeye demanded that one of the two new members that they're recruiting has to be Firestar. He announced it to the world prematurely. He was that confident. The other members are like, whoa, whoa, let's hold on a second here because that spot that we had open was actually for you, Hawkeye. So, but they settled on reserve member. That's fine, that's good enough. Now cut to issue seven, the former X-Men member became a full Avengers member. Firestar was also amongst the lucky 198 mutants to have kept their abilities after the Scarlet Witch decimated the mutant population. Number seven, Wizard. This dude was only an Avenger for four years in the comics, but he's funky enough to mention. I feel like we don't talk about Wizard enough. Robert Frank Sr. made his first appearance in USA Comics 1, and after a run-in with a Cobra, he was bitten and his father had to use mongoose blood to try and save him the old fashioned way, where he sucks the poison out. Some wives tale and it surely worked, but his father had a heart attack during this do-it-yourself transfusion and bit the bullet. Robert, on the other hand, was blessed with super speed after this. And then he became the wizard. Great name, great name. He joined the Avengers in issue 173 back in 1978, but he met his fate and vision in the Scarlet Witch issue two in 1982. Number six, Demolition Man. Dennis Murphy, born in Detroit, Michigan. He looked up to superheroes quite a bit, as do most of us. He was actually great at football, but he wasn't great enough to be recruited professionally. Sad times. But then that's when the power broker comes in to strike up a bargain. Super strength ought to help you with those home games, right, Dennis? Let's do it. Well, what happened was he got so strong that if he did decide to play football with these humans, he would probably break through them. His name is Demolition Man. Nobody would expect this guy to be an Avenger because he wasn't even the best football player. That's like what Peter Parker says. He's like, I couldn't do stuff then, so I can't do stuff now. You know? He joined the Avengers in Captain America issue 349. He helped Battlestar and US Agent free Captain America. And when US Agent and Flag Smasher started to get a little distracted, D-Man himself finished the mission properly. Number five, lightning. Living lightning, here we go. It's hard to imagine that a man made of lightning would ever not get the spotlight, but that's what happens when you share the pages with this team. Lightning, AKA Miguel Santos, first came into comics as a villain, actually. But he joined the West Coast Avengers in issue 74. Now his father, cut to way before, his father was part of this group called the Legion of Living Lightning, or LOL, as some would say. And when they tried to gain control of the Hulk, which is a terrible idea, his father was killed in action. Again, terrible idea, don't fight the Hulk. So Miguel wanted to learn more of his father in the Legion, so he broke into the Legion's headquarters, and while he was snooping around, one of the machines turned on, and he turned into a living energy. Now, he almost joined the Great Lakes Avengers at one point, but only because he thought GLA meant Gay Lesbian Alliance. I don't think Great Lakes are as exciting, but you never know. We have one over here, it's Lake Ontario. It's way too cold and smelly. I would much rather gay lesbian alliances. The team had the worst luck when it came to recruits. Let's just say that. Number four, Stingray. Walter Newell made his comic book debut in Tales to Astonish issue 95. Now his life began as an oceanographer and an engineer. And once he created, 
and once he created a suit built for deep sea exploration, a cool nickname was bound to come afterwards. Stingray, there it is, that's a cool nickname. He was ordered to bring in Namor to investigate the disappearance of water from our oceans. He ended up working with Namor numerous times, water bros for life, and then he joined the team as a reserve member in the Avengers issue 319. Funny enough, in the Armor Wars storyline, Iron Man wanted to recover all these suits that had Stark tech in it. So he comes in, knocks out Stingray, and then after attaching the negator pack, nothing happened. So the suit was indeed not stolen. You know, it's always nice when you knock someone out for no reason. I'd love to see him make an appearance in the Armor Wars Disney show, but I think we need a lot of other stuff first before we even look at Stingray. Although he is cool. Number three, Jack of Hearts. Jonathan Hart, son of Philip Hart, a brilliant scientist who developed the liquid called Zero Fluid, and his mother was actually part of the Contraxian race. Now, the alien woman was also a scientist sent to discover this energy source to help their dying Contraxian son. Now, the alien lady heard about Philip Hart's experiments, so they met, got married, and then out came Jack. And then later on, when Jack was a teenager, his father had completed the zero fluid, but was sadly killed by the agents of a criminal corporation who wanted the fluid for themselves to market it. Classic bad guy stuff. Give us your fluids. Let's fight. So when Jack hid in his father's lab, he was covered in said zero fluid. And then he started to glow and change and become more powerful becoming the Jack of Hearts. Energy was just oozing out of his body. He handled his father's killers easily after that. He then joined the Avengers in volume three, issue 43. Number two, not one, but two guns. He's got two guns, the two gun kid. Let's talk about him. Of course, we can't forget this rootin' tootin' Avenger. Look out, gang, here he comes. Matt Hawk joined the team in Avengers 142. This guy's fun. Now, the cover alone, let's talk about this. The Avengers versus the wild Western heroes of all. Let's go, I'm gonna read this right now. He was a Harvard-educated Boston lawyer who settled in 1870s Tombstone, Texas after the Civil War. Like the Civil War, not Civil War, like the Civil War, you get it? I don't really have to pitch what his life was pre-Avengers. I mean, there's horses, there's shooting, there's lots of nice boots. One day he saved the life of this elderly man. He was getting picked on by a rootin' tootin' gang. But this man just happened to be legendary gunslinger, Ben Dancer. It's Ben Dancer. So Ben is exactly what you'd imagine in your head. I read all of his lines in Sam Elliott's voice because, well, of course I did, look at him. So he, of course, trained Matt. And then when the Avengers fought Kang back in that era, so once the dust had settled, literally, the dust had settled, the two-gun kid came back to the modern era with the team. And Hawkeye had a pretty good time as well. This is when he started to dig the West Coast life. He wanted to leave the Avengers, because being a bow and arrow man made more sense to be out there than Manhattan. I, I have to agree. And finally, number one, we can't forget about him, the Forgotten One. Gilgamesh made his first appearance in Eternals issue 13. He was born before the Ice Age, and in 3000 BC, the Eternal became Gilgamesh, king of Uruk in Sumeria. In ancient times, he would wander the earth battling tyrants and taking down beasts. He would fight alongside Hercules and even took down the demon dragon zoo. He fought for the Roman Empire as a centurion, just taking out tribes left and right. And then he joined the Avengers in issue 300. And currently he works alongside Hercules and the gods of war. Now I feel like we're gonna see this guy soon in the MCU. I mean, the Eternals movie, Thor, Love and Thunder, bringing in some gods. Eh, the forgotten one, no more, I have a feeling. Kicking off the list at number 10, M. Monet St. Croix made her first appearance in Generation X issue one as Penance. And by the time issue 40 rolled around, she was introduced as Monet. She was the second child of Ambassador Cartier St. Croix, who was a wealthy former president of numerous corporations. Now, although she had an older brother and two young twin sisters, her father still favored her. Now her brother Marius had mutant abilities and when they manifested, he became evil. Sadly, he actually took out his mother and was kicked out of the family. And then he asked Monet to join him traveling through other dimensions, gaining power. She was like, nope. I'm good, thanks. So she rejected him, and Marius trapped her in this form of a mute creature with diamond hard red skin. And he fed on her powers. What a not nice guy. It's awful. So Claudia and Nicole, her sisters, the twins, they joined forces. Like, literally. They merged into a new version of Monet. And it was all pretty much the same personality, appearance, and powers. M is a telepathic genius, and of course, super strength and super speed sure does help her get the job done. Before we continue on with this list, guys, if you want to go ahead and give us a thumbs up, that would be great. It does help our channel quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's go right back into this list. I don't want to waste any more time. Number nine, Frenzy. Okay, Joanna Cargill. She made her first debut in X Factor issue four. Now she accidentally punched her father so hard that her hand went through his chestal plate. 
which is just a great way to find out you have powers. Now her father was in no means a good person at all, but still, finding out you're a mutant in that way is pretty rough. That's pretty traumatizing for a young kid. So she became known as Frenzy and she joined the Allegiance of Evil. Now after the Acolytes disbanded, Joanna became ambassador for Genosha and stood by Magneto until she was captured by the US government in order to learn more about Magneto, but she didn't talk. She was a tough one. She didn't talk until Jean Grey entered and freed her, giving her the option to join the X-Men the easy way or the hard way. Jean used the hard way and then Frenzy's entire attitude was changed. Her personality was like campy, it was awkward, not nearly as confident as before, but her powers were still there. She did help the X-Men find Magneto's base. She was a team member, even if it was forced and campy. So after Magneto's defeat, her mind control was released and she rejoined the Acolytes and then left the X Mansion. Super speed, super strength, super stamina, super everything, you name it, she's got it. Her body has been described as being hard as steel, making the She-Hulk put up quite a fight. Number eight, armor. Hisako Ichiki made her first appearance in Astonishing X-Men Volume 3, Issue 4. Now, she grew up in Japan before joining the Xavier Institute. She formed a close relationship with Wing and Blindfold once she joined Katie Pride's Paladin Squad. Now, her new close friends were being attacked one day by Ord of Breakworld, so Armor used her unique mutant abilities to take care of him with a mighty punch. She can create the psionic exoskeleton suit of armor, hence the name armor. It's fueled by the energy of Hisako's ancestors. In the Ultimate Universe, her abilities create quite the spectacle as well. They appear in the shape of these massive animals, these great beasts, even dragons at some point. As if these abilities weren't surprising and fantastic enough, she also received combat training from Wolverine and tactic training from Cyclops. So she's kind of a big deal. Number seven, Vulcan. He named himself after the Roman god of fire, but Vulcan's real identity was that of Gabriel Summers. He was born after Cyclops and Havoc, well, not really. He wasn't really born. He was actually surgically removed from his mother's body and placed in an incubator accelerator, then aged to be at his prime, and then sent to Earth to work for Dak and Shikari. One of those normal childhoods, you know? So he escaped and he was found by Mora McTaggart with no memories of who he is or where he came from. Poor kid. So we asked for Charles' help and then all Kid Vulcan wanted to do was learn about his mutant abilities. Sounds like the perfect student. Like, come on, you're doing all the right things. Charles needed help from him and other newcomers to find the remaining X-Men. So Charles put him in this danger room as a training exercise to get them sharp in a short amount of real time. So it felt like months of training, but in fact, it's only a few hours. And then Vulcan and this new team were sent to Krakoa to rescue the original X-Men. But Vulcan revealed to Scott that Xavier sacrificed his own brother to save him. Number six, Maggot. That's a fun name right off the bat. Maggot? Maggot, or I mean, Japeth, first appeared in Uncanny X-Men issue 345. He was born with five siblings, but never grew at the same rate as them. And on top of that, he had struggled with pains in his stomach. Sadly, those pains turned out to maybe be cancer, and he feared that he would run his family dry with medical bills. So at just age 12, he left the South African village and started to think of a dark solution to his problem. Super tragic. So he ended up in the Kalahari Desert and was found by Magneto, who figured out that these stomach issues were actually these two slug-like creatures that lived in the boy's body, and they acted as his digestive system. Years later, Maggot reached out to Magneto in hopes that he would help him with this gross situation. Now the slugs, named Eenie and Meenie, because that's what you do when you have slugs, you give them cute nicknames, they were these sentient techno-organic slugs that could devour anything. Doesn't matter what kind of matter you are, gone, devoured. They would do it fast too, not at the pace of normal slugs. And once lunchtime was finished, they would return back to Japeth's stomach, transferring the energy from what they just consumed, granting him super strength and durability. Also, we had a nice avatar tan to go along with these magnificent abilities. Number five, Kid Omega. Now again, the word kid is used lightly in this list. You do not want to underestimate Quentin Quire, aka Kid Omega. He made his first appearance in X-Men issue 134. He's been described as one of the most powerful telepaths next to Jean Grey. So off the bat, you know you're in for a treat. He was one of Xavier's prized pupils. That is until, of course, he put together the Omega Gang, which was this gang that would handle humans after they've committed crimes against mutants. They would do it themselves, not in the poetic way, to say the least. They were like the super kid police. They even went to a tattoo shop and made it official. They got these Omega symbols tattooed over top of the X. Now his abilities are insane. He can manipulate your perception, judgment, wills, and common sense. He's able to track you down by listening to your thoughts, folks. Your thoughts, you can hear your thoughts. And even in this instance, if you were a telepath, you wouldn't see him coming because he would block out your powers to sneak up on you. One of the coolest things about Quentin is the psionic shotgun that he can create. It just looks cool. He just channels all this mental energy as this astral energy shotgun. And if that doesn't do the trick, yeah, the psionic rocket launcher should. Number four, 
Kubark, aka Kid Gladiator, another kid. Kubark is the son of Emperor Gladiator. He was this young prince sent to Earth to train and discover more secrets about his powers. And the one place you go and do that is of course the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. Warbird was his bodyguard, and the reason that he was sent to Earth, this new kid on the block, was because he destroyed more than half of the Shi'ar royal city on Chandelar. Just for fun, you know? In Wolverine and the X-Men, he arrives and starts giving orders to other students, like to bring him snacks, the whole thing. And he wanted these students to call him their new Imperial Overlord. He's jam-packed with superpowers though. He can possess the ability to fly and his eyes are pretty interesting, not just to look at. He has microscopic vision and can blast heat beams through those peepers. And with an incredible lung capacity, he can take in large amounts of air and blast it out, creating these hurricane-like winds. And if that doesn't work, he can use his breath to freeze you dead in your tracks. Number three, Lifeguard, AKA Heather Cameron. Lifeguard is such a cool character. Okay, let's talk about her. She's super unique. She made her first debut in Extreme X-Men issue six. And judging by her name, yes, she of course started off as a lifeguard and also as a surfer. Her mutant ability is that of a lifeguard, literally. Her powers allow her to manifest whatever is needed to save the life of somebody near her. If you're allergic to peanuts, bam, EpiPen, stab, we're good. She's like the super medic of the X-Men, she's awesome. After the events of M-Day, Heather was one of the lucky to retain her abilities. She's almost a combination of Darwin and Mystique. Now I talked about Darwin in part one of this list, so if you want a little bit of catching up to do, you know where to find that. Number two, Zeitgeist. Axel Clooney, he was seen in Deadpool 2 and he made his first comic book appearance in X-Force issue 116. His ability, mm, let's just talk about it. He can spit acid, like a lot of acid, so much acid. It can eat through any substance. And I think what makes this character even more wild is when he himself discovered these powers for the first time. Oh boy, okay. He was at the beach hanging out. He met this lovely woman. They clicked, it was romantic. They were nice, they were kissing on the beach. And then all of a sudden, this uh, this happens. A lot of acid puke, a lot of puke, real nasty stuff. Ugh. But this guy is super powerful. Like he can take on so many mutants. I mean, it's gross, but if only he didn't spew it out of his mouth, maybe he had fingers that could do the acid shooting, he'd be less of a gag, pun intended. And finally coming in at number one, Jubilee. Making her first appearance in Uncanny X-Men issue 244, Jubilee, AKA Jubilation Lee, first discovered her mutant power of generating these dazzling sparkles from her hands. She was always seen as this little sister type character from the start, but she packs a powerful pretty punch. She was discovered by Dazzler, Cyclops, Rogue, and Storm during a rescue at the mall. And when she followed the women back through a portal, she ended up at the X-Men's temporary base in the Australian Outback. Jubilee and Wolverine ended up becoming a good pair, working missions together, and they were a fun duo. Now her powers grew to a whole new level, when a vampire ended up infecting the area of Union Square. This happens in Curse of the Mutants, and Jubilee being caught in the path of this infection ended up becoming a vampire. It's, it's a pretty big deal. Even before the vampire stuff, this is a highly underrated character to this day. Number 10, Hawkeye. Now I know what you're thinking, Hawkeye is basically the Aquaman of the Marvel world because everyone is just, everyone just kind of brushes him off, you know? But trust me when I say that he is a lot better than you think. Although Clint Barton doesn't actually possess any superpowers, he has always been a major asset to the Avengers or whatever team he's on, honestly. Clint is a master archer, specializing in any type of bow imaginable thanks to years of training, and he's capable of firing multiple arrows at once at a single target in a few seconds, hitting multiple targets in just a few quick strokes, and directly hit small targets in the greatest of distances. Not only that, but he is in peak physical condition for a human, has extraordinary eyesight, is an expert acrobat, and a master at many martial arts. As a part of multiple iterations of the Avengers, S.H.I.E.L.D., the Thunderbolts, and so many more, Clint has helped take down some of the biggest and baddest enemies in the Marvel Universe, despite being a fairly average dude. There's so much more to this character that meets the eye, and I truly feel like he doesn't get all the credit that he's due. So check out his story for yourself, starting with his first appearance in 1964's Tales of Suspense, number 57. Number 9, Catherine Pride. Catherine Kitty Pride was leading the normal life of an extremely gifted 13-year-old girl in Deerfield, Illinois, when she began suffering increasingly intense headaches. Little did she know that the headaches were actually a result of Kitty's mutant powers emerging, which is the ability to pass through solid matter. Professor X soon after located her and sought to recruit her as a new member of the X-Men and she eventually received permission from her parents to join the mutant team. The youngest person to join the X-Men, she was first portrayed as a kid sister to many older members of the group, filling the role of literary foil to the more established characters. She occasionally used the codename Sprite and Ariel, cycling through several uniforms until settling for her trademark black and gold costume. Thanks to her training with the X-Men, she was able to further develop her powers to make them even more useful, as she is now able to use her phasing ability to phase alongside other people, phasing the entire X-Men team once, 
so you can also camouflage yourself. And after having her potential released by the Black Vortex, she was resistant to telepathic effects. Despite this immense power, she is low on this list today because she is unable to breathe while phasing, and in order to phase through an object, she has to know it's coming, which has been exploited many, many times. Take a look at her powers for yourself, starting with her first appearance in 1980's X-Men number 129. Number 8, Nightcrawler. The son of Mystique and the demon Azazel, Kurt Wagner was never legally adopted by anyone, but was raised within the circus. He grew up in Max Getman's circus, and his two closest friends were his quote-unquote adopted brother and sister, Stefan and Jemaine Sardos. Kurt and Stefan forged a true friendship as they grew older, and Stefan knew that his magical heritage might lure him to evil one day, so Stefan had Kurt promise him a blood oath that if he ever killed without reason, Kurt would kill him as well. Long before his teleportation power emerged, Wagner had tremendous natural agility, and by adolescence he had become the circus's star acrobatic and aerial artist. He also possessed the superhuman agility, the ability to teleport, and adhesive hands and feet. His physical mutations include indigo-colored velvety fur, which allows him to become nearly invisible in shadows, two-toed feet, and three-fingered hands. Also yellowed eyes, pointed ears, and a prehensile tail. He is also immortal due to him sacrificing his soul, which means there are no natural means of killing him anymore. In Nightcrawler's earlier comic book appearances, he's depicted as being a happy-go-lucky practical joker and teaser, and a fan of swashbuckling fiction. Nightcrawler is also a Catholic, and while that's not really emphasized as much as in his earlier comic book appearances, in later depictions, Nightcrawler is more vocal about his faith. As a member of the X-Men and founding member of Excalibur, we have seen Nightcrawler use his abilities in unique and clever ways to battle Spider-Man, the Punisher, Jigsaw, Cutthroat, and so many more. Take a look at Kurt for yourself, starting with 1975's Giant Size X-Men, number one. Number seven, Jubilee. Born and raised in Beverly Hills, California, Jubilation Lee lived a pretty great life, honestly. Attended an exclusive school and was believed to have potential to go to the Olympics for gymnastics. After one terrible night, though, Lee lost both her parents and all of the family money, leaving her all alone. She was sent to an orphanage not long after, but ran away and hid in a Hollywood shopping mall, stealing food as much as she could to survive. Jubilee first discovered her mutant power to generate blinding and explosive energy fireworks while running away from mall security. The stress of running away from the security guards caused her to emit a large light energy blast while in a back alley while completely disorienting the man and creating an opening for her to escape. Upon learning about her mutant ability to create fireworks, Jubilee realized she could earn money by using her powers to entertain customers and visitors in the mall, and that's exactly what she did for a while. Now after the Reavers took over the X-Men base and captured Wolverine, Jubilee helped free him and escape, and the two quickly formed a familial bond through a father-daughter type relationship, and this was pretty much her introduction as a member of the X-Men. Now obviously there is a lot more to her story, but I will let you figure out exactly what that is for yourself. Now I briefly mentioned her powers before, but to go into a little bit more detail, Jubilee is capable of luminate kinetic explosive light blasting, which she has dubbed fireworks, and these can be used in many forms and for offensive or defensive purposes, such as hitting someone dead on or just blinding an enemy to escape. Check out her skills for yourself in her first appearance in 1989's Uncanny X-Men number 244. Number 6, Wonder Man. One of the Avengers' more troubled team members, Simon Williams. Simon inherited his father's company, Williams Innovations, and ended up running it into the ground with the help of competition from Stark Industries. He was later then arrested for embezzling funds from the company, giving him a bitter hatred for Iron Man that was then leveraged by the supervillain Baron Zemo in a plan against the Avengers. After being given powers by Zemo, however, Simon betrays him and chooses to fight alongside the team he once fought against, the Avengers. The exact nature of his powers isn't always clear, but regardless, this energy gives his body a massive power up beyond the capability of normal humans. One of the powers being, of course, super strength. Wonder Man's strength is said to be on par with Thor and possibly even Sentry. I mean, he was literally able to knock Thor out once with a single punch. And this is a result of experiments by Zemo. Wonder Man is also imbued with ionic energy, giving him super stamina, speed and agility, and also flight and superhuman reflexes, as well as making him pretty much indestructible. Wonder Man can also absorb various forms of energy, including antimatter, and is able to project powerful energy blasts at will, and can even exist as pure energy if he wishes to. Perhaps the biggest quirk of his abilities, however, is that he doesn't actually require any food, water, or oxygen to survive, thanks to his vast reserves of energy. Check him out for yourself in his first appearance in 1964's Avengers, number 9. Number 5, Cersei. A member of the Eternals, Cersei easily ranks as one of the group's most overpowered members and, in my opinion, is one of the most underrated characters in the Marvel Universe in terms of ability. Like many other members of the Eternals, she is tens of thousands of years old, meaning she has seen quite a bit in her time. 
She officially joins the Earth's Mightiest Heroes in Avengers number 314, partially due to her desire to protect humanity, but mostly because of her fondness for Captain America. Possessing the strength, speed, stamina, and combat skills, and invulnerability you'd expect from the Eternals, it's said that the only way to actually kill Cersei for good is to scatter her atoms about. Also similar to her fellow Eternals, her ability to fire cosmic blasts from her hands. Cersei is somewhat unique amongst her peers due to her strong telekinetic abilities. What cements Cersei as one of Marvel's most powerful heroes, however, is her incredible transmutation ability allowing her to reshape matter at a molecular level. She is considered a fifth level adept at transmutation, which is also the highest possible level. And she has used her power to turn a deviant to rubber, give the Avengers gills, and even disintegrate air itself. It also seems that she can create sentient life, bringing stone statues to life and turning inanimate objects into various animals and creatures at will. Check out her immense power for yourself, starting with her first appearance in 1976's Eternals, number three. Number four, Gilgamesh. Often referred to as the Forgotten One, Gilgamesh's heroic exploits have become so legendary over the millennia that he's often referred to as heroes of myth, like Hercules and Gilgamesh, which explains why he just goes by Gilgamesh. He is one of, if not the strongest member of the hidden group of superpowered beings known as the Eternals, an ancient race of genetically altered humans created by the Celestials. Alongside his teammates, he helps shield humanity from the vicious deviants, though Gilgamesh seems to have a very soft spot for just protecting the people of Earth. He joined the Avengers in a time where their membership was at an all-time low, and although his time with them was pretty short-lived, he was an absolutely vital member of the team. While all Eternals are born with an inherent set of superhuman abilities such as super strength, Gilgamesh's strength far exceeds that of his counterparts, making him one of the most physically powerful characters in all of Marvel, with strength comparable to that of Hercules, Thor, and other godlike beings. As a result of countless millennia of training, Gilgamesh is also an extremely skilled hand-to-hand -hand combat fighter, which, coupled with his imperviousness to damage, makes him one of Marvel's most dangerous characters. As is the case with most other Eternals, Gilgamesh can also emit deadly beams of light, heat, and physical force from his hands and eyes, and can manipulate matter to a limited degree. Give his story a read for yourself, starting with 1977's Eternals, number 13. Number 3, Squirrel Girl. Born to Dorian and Maureen Green, Dorian Green suffered a modification in her genes for unknown reasons that granted her squirrel-like abilities, which manifested predominantly in the form of a prehensile tail. When her parents consulted with the doctor, it was determined that Dorian wasn't actually a mutant, even though it was just kind of assumed that she was. At the age of 10, she discovered that she could communicate with squirrels, and that's how she met Monkey Joe, who encouraged her to use her powers and abilities for good. Her full arsenal of powers is kind of like Spider-Man's if you think about it, but with squirrel attributes as opposed to, you know, spidey powers. She has super strength, superhuman jaw strength, a regenerative healing factor, and of course her three foot prehensile tail that she can basically use as an extra limb. The best thing about Squirrel Girl though in my opinion, and honestly everyone else's that I've talked to, is that she is so immensely kind and friendly, which somehow makes her more powerful. At one point, Doreen hijacked an Iron Man suit to head outside the stratosphere and face off against Galactus, and in true Squirrel Girl fashion, she is able to instead convince Galactus into letting her find a tasty alternative to consuming the planet Earth like a Thin Mint, getting him to admit that all the people in skyscrapers would just, I don't know, hurt his mouth. She befriended the planet Devourer, and that is absolutely nuts. In addition to Galactus, she has also quote-unquote defeated Kraven the Hunter and Doctor Doom, something that not every hero can say. Check out Doreen for yourself in her first appearance in 1991's Marvel Super Heroes Volume 2. Number 2, The Sentry. Robert Reynolds, aka Sentry, aka Marvel's dark answer to Superman. He's a superhero with a ton of powers, but he is constantly at war with the dark force within called the Void. So basically, when a middle-aged Bob remembers he was once the superhero of the century, he returns to his heroic life when he finds out the Void, his arch enemy, is returning to Earth. However, most of Earth's population has no memory of him. It's later revealed that the Void is a second personality within him, and that both personas have been erased to protect himself and the world. His powers come from a special version of the Super Soldier formula called the Golden Sentry Serum, and has given him the power of immortality alongside superhuman levels of speed, strength, agility, and stamina, as well as teleportation, flight, and just so much more. Sentry has been seen easily lifting 100 tons with little to no effort, meaning that if he really, really pushes himself, his weight limit could be, I don't know, like 110 tons or even 150. Honestly, who knows, this is just speculation, but when you take into consideration all the additional powers that Sentry has, we think being in the top five of Marvel's strongest heroes is a fair ranking. Throughout the Marvel Universe, Sentry has been seen as a member of the New Avengers, the Mighty Avengers, the Dark Avengers, and even the Horsemen of Death, and every time he has been a vital member to the group. Check him out for yourself, starting with 2000's Sentry, number one. And number one, Franklin Richards. Sure, his parents are strong, you know, Sue and Reed Richards, very strong, I think we all know that, but 
Who knew that combining their mutagenic genes would create the most powerful being in the cosmos? Franklin Richards is a mutant who is classified as a rare and omega level character. His most powerful characteristic is that he can literally warp reality as well as control the fundamental forces of the universe. He is one of the strongest mutants to ever exist with powers equal to that of celestials, meaning he is on par with literal gods. Unlike most other mutants, his powers actually manifested before puberty and needless to say, wielding such a power at an early age gave cause for concern from his family. But Franklin has proven more than capable of using his power since and even made the devourer of worlds Galactus his herald. Honestly, feats of strength don't get any more bold than that, and given how Franklin still has plenty of room left to grow, it stands to reason that he could become not just the universe's most powerful hero, but its most powerful inhabitant as well. There's also an alternate universe where Franklin obtains immortality alongside all his original powers, which is just insane. It's just insane if you think about it. Check out his story for yourself in his first appearance in 1968's Fantastic Four Annual, number 6.